Computer animations are everywhere. In movies, commercials, video games and virtual reality. They are made by digital artists and graphics programmers to create the illusion of movement by turning static images into a sequence of frames that appears as continuous motion. But besides animations, you might have heard about computer simulations. Simulations are used by scientists and computational engineers to predict how physical systems behave. For example, if an object hits another one at a certain angle, simulations can be used to compute the resulting motion of these objects by solving the corresponding physical equations. The tricky part is that animations and simulations often look very similar. It's easy to confuse them, but they are not the same. The difference is hidden behind the scenes. That's why in this video we will go through a simple example, first animating and then simulating the same process. By focusing on a relatively simple physical scenario, it becomes much easier to see the differences between animating and simulating, so that by the end we will have a clear understanding of how animations and simulations work. The specific example that we will consider is the deformation of an object. Here you can see an animation of a deforming rubber material. And for comparison, here is a simulation of the same process. As you can see, or not see, it's really hard to tell the difference between the animation and the simulation. But if we can't see the difference, then what is the difference? Let's first break down how I created the animation. I made this animation in the 3D computer graphics software Blender. First I generated the geometry of the rubber, and then I built the clamps that deform it. And finally, to animate the deformation, I simply linearly scaled the rubber in the vertical direction, and I told Blender to transform the undeformed geometry into the scaled deformed geometry. And after a little bit of fine tuning, this is the final result. At this point I should mention that I work on simulations rather than animations. So my animation skills are very limited. Others could have done a much better job than me. Still you might say, hey, this animation looks cool, job done. But people working on simulations wouldn't be satisfied with these results. And this is for two reasons. The first reason is that in the animation, I hard-coded the deformation of the rubber. I basically told the software exactly how it should stretch over time. But who can guarantee that the rubber will actually deform that way? If we take a close look at the animation from the front, we see that while the rubber stretches in one direction, its width and thickness remains unchanged. This is very unrealistic, most rubbers are nearly incompressible. This means if we pull in one direction, it should compress in the other directions. Engineers call this the Poisson effect. Animations do not capture such physical behavior. They are just meant to look fancy. Of course we could forcibly introduce a transversal deformation into the animation. But still we wouldn't know precisely how this deformation should look like. Animation is essentially about creating visuals that are appealing to the viewer. For instance in films or video games. But just because it looks cool doesn't mean it accurately reflects reality. The second reason why people working on simulations wouldn't be satisfied with the animation is that while animations might look impressive, they don't provide any additional information about the underlying physical process. For example, our animation doesn't tell us the force that is needed to deform the rubber. And it doesn't tell us how stresses are distributed in the rubber. And this is exactly why we need computer simulations. In simulations, we do not simply animate a process. Instead, we solve the physical equations underlying this process. In our example, to accurately predict the deformation of the rubber, we have to solve a set of quite complicated equations in 3D. This is not at all easy, and it requires a deep understanding of continuum mechanics, tensor calculus and differential equations. So in this video we will not talk in detail about how this can be done. But if you want to learn the mathematical details, you should definitely check out the other videos on my channel. Here I just want to give you a very short summary of how to set up such a simulation, using one of the most widely used approaches. First we generate the geometry of the rubber, and then we divide it into many small elements. These are called finite elements, and we need them to solve the underlying equations using the so-called finite element method. In the finite element simulation, we fix the displacement at the bottom of the rubber, 
and we prescribe a vertical displacement at the top. During the simulation, the displacements at the points within the geometry are computed over different time steps, and after the computation is done, we can use Blender to make the results look nice. In the simulation, we can nicely see that the deformation of the rubber looks more physical, and we can see the Poisson effect that was missing in the animation. The rubber gets slimmer in the directions perpendicular to the applied stretch. In contrast to the animation, where we told the object how to behave, in the simulation the physics tells the object how to behave. This is the subtle but important difference. A simulation doesn't only look cool. It provides important information that scientists and simulation engineers are interested in. For example, during the simulation, the force needed to deform the rubber is computed alongside. So the simulation gives us a relationship between the force applied to an object and how much it deforms. As you can imagine, this is extremely useful in many applications. For example, civil engineers can predict how a bridge deforms or mechanical engineers how a car behaves in a crash. And there are countless other applications. But you should know that we should never blindly trust a simulation. Simulations always rely on assumptions. For our example, I assumed that the rubber has no defects and that the deformation is very slow. When we run computer simulations, we should always make sure that the assumptions are reasonable. Because computational engineers are mainly interested in computing the response of physical systems, they usually do not care so much about the visuals. That's why computer simulations often do not look as fancy as animations. So, if you like to make things look cool, you should maybe consider becoming a digital artist or a graphics programmer. But if you want to better understand the physics behind the scenes, you should consider becoming a computational engineer. That said, I'm a bit worried that what I've told you so far could leave the impression that simulating is somehow more advanced or complex than animating. This is not at all the case. Like simulating, animating is extremely difficult and it involves a lot of math. In video games, for example, we must animate fluid flows and the motion of objects, all while accounting for the effects of light, shadows and reflections. And one of the greatest challenges is to do all this in real time. When two objects collide, we cannot wait a second or two for computing the resulting motion. These computations must be done in milliseconds so that the gamer doesn't even notice. People like me who work on simulations usually don't face this problem. We just start a simulation, leave the room to get a coffee, and when we come back the simulation is done. Or we notice that the solver crashed at the very last time step and we have to start the whole process again. At the end I should say that there's not always a sharp line between animating and simulating. For example, major movie studios and video game developers realized early that adding even a little bit of physics during animation makes the results much more realistic. That's why most animation software feature at least a few physical simulation tools, which are used for example to animate object collisions or fluid flows. This can really speed up the animation process. Instead of animating a physical process frame by frame, it's much more convenient to let the physics do the job. So most animations you see in films or games are actually somewhere between pure animation and simulation. It just looks better if some physics is taken into account. That's it for today, thanks for watching, I hope you liked this quite different video format where we didn't cover so much mathematics. Thank you so much for 10,000 subscribers, it's awesome, it's been so much fun making these videos and chatting with you in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe and see you soon, bye!